Boom. Hey, everybody hear me okay? Good? All right. Hey, everybody. My name is Brian, and over the last seven years, I've had the privilege of working at some awesome companies here in Atlanta, like 352 and Yik Yak. Today, I work at a company called MailChimp as a mobile product designer, and I help design our native mobile applications, both iOS and Android. So before we jump in today, I wanted to start by saying thank you. We don't ship sketch files, we don't ship JIRA tickets, we don't ship backlogs, we ship code. More specifically, we ship code that's written by you all. And all of this today, all the stuff that we work on, none of any of that would be possible without the effort that all of you put in, day in and day out. So on behalf of every designer you've ever worked with, myself, and Mr. Dwight Schrute, I just wanted to say thank you very much. So let's talk about why we're here today. I think that every person on a team, whether that's a big team or a small team, has a unique perspective on the world. And I think that sometimes our skill sets and our expertise, they can make us feel limited on the things that we can contribute that perspective onto in terms of the products that we build. But I think a good experience, it doesn't come from good designers. It comes from good teams. And I believe that the best experiences are the ones that reflect all of the perspectives of the weird, quirky, awesome, and unique human beings that helped to build it. So today, my goal is to empower everyone, regardless of role, to contribute their own unique perspective onto the products that they're building. So that is a pretty lofty goal for 35 minutes, but here we go. Uh, I've broken this down into two categories. And in the first half, we're going to talk about communication, more on the internal side, like with your team and organizationally. And then in the second half, we'll talk about some more practical ways that we can improve our mobile experiences. So for the communication part, we're going to talk about things like having a roadmap, friction, and sharing a common language. And then for the more practical applications, we'll talk about things like perceived performance, helping our users not screw up, and then we'll talk a whole lot about notifications. So let's start with a product roadmap. Having a visible roadmap for where your product is going is extremely helpful for a number of different reasons. So at a higher level, what it does is it aligns everyone in your organization with the product's goals. On a day-to-day -day basis, it helps your teams more effectively plan sustainable solutions. And it also empowers those teams to think beyond the solutions that are prescribed to them and instead uncover unique solutions that all drive toward the same goal. So granted, organizationally, workflow-wise, every company is going to be a little bit different, but the value of a visible product roadmap is basically this. Having a visible product roadmap empowers everyone in your organization to make a meaningful and strategic impact on the things that you're building. So if at your organization you don't have a visible uh, product roadmap right now, I want to talk about essentially the four steps that go into creating one. But I kind of want to throw a, a caveat before this whole thing. Roadmaps are tough. They require buy-in communication with uh, stakeholders pretty much throughout your organization. So I don't want to misrepresent um, how much of an on-taking this is with just these four steps. But I did want you to walk away feeling empowered like you could create one if you didn't have one where you're at. So first thing you're going to want to do is define your product strategy. And that's essentially defining who your customers are, what problems you're going to solve for them, and how you're going to be different from competitors in the market. Second, you're going to want to compile your requirements. And this one's pretty broad, but what it boils down to is establishing what features you're going to need in order to get to market, and then what features are going to come thereafter in the future. And then you want to prioritize all those features based on their impact on your larger business goals. Third, you want to establish the timeline for those prioritized features from step two. Um, in your timeline, you want to avoid using specific dates so that you can stay flexible when it comes to building. And it'll also help you to not make delivery promises too early on in the process. And fourth, and probably most important, is share it. I mean, internally, but share it far and wide so that everyone knows where we're headed, who we're going after, how we're going to be successful in doing that, and what the progression looks like as we're building. So again, there's way more to creating a, a roadmap than just those four steps, but I wanted you to walk away with 
something rather than just a concept. If you're looking to dive a little bit deeper um, into this subject, um, while I was doing my research, two of the sites that I found that were super helpful um, and very informative were smartsheet.com and aha.io. Highly recommend. All right, so that's the benefit of having a product roadmap and some steps on how to create one. So moving on, I wanna talk about friction. And friction as it relates to communication and how sometimes that friction can be a good thing. So friction is defined as the resistance that one object encounters when moving over another. So I want you to remember why you're sitting where you're sitting. Remember why you founded your company, why you were hired, or why you're a part of the team that you're a part of. Your experience, your point of view, your instincts, they're all important. That's what got you here. Those are all the things that make you, you. That's what shapes your perspective. And the same can be said for your teammates. All of the things that make them, them, that's what got them where they are alongside you. So with all those unique perspectives, as we start to try and solve problems together, I can often bring about differing opinions, some friction, right? The best way to handle that is to be a champion for your priorities and really just let that friction handle the rest. It's super important that you do not be a jerk while you're actively doing this. That's key. So let me try to say that another way. What I mean is embrace the priorities that you bring to the table, but also be inclusive of the priorities that other functions on your team are gonna bring to the table. So think about it like this. Every function within a team has a priority, right? Product managers, what do they wanna do? They wanna get features out the door as quickly as possible, spending the least amount of effort that they can. Designers, we want every pixel to be perfect. We want gradients, we want transitions, we want transitions for our transitions, we want all of it, right? And engineers, if I may, uh, want to write scalable code that's complete with no bugs and you only want to have to write it once. So as all these priorities converge, there's going to be compromise and tough conversations and therein lies that friction, right? So as these priorities start to push up against one another, the best solutions are going to be the ones that exist right there in the middle. That equilibrium where you have that friction but there's still balance. So no set of priorities outweighs the other, right? Because if, let's say, you're out of balance on the product management side, you could find yourself in situations where you might be shipping experiences that could be incomplete or maybe just not as good as they could be all in the name of hitting deadlines. And by that same respect, on the other side of that coin, if you're out of whack from a design standpoint, you could be making the most beautiful experiences. You could have transitions for your gradients and gradients for your transitions and all that good stuff, but maybe you're not shipping, right? So it's important to keep in mind that we want to stay in that sweet spot in the middle, and we can do that by being champions for the priorities that we represent on our teams and letting friction establish that balance between ours and all the other priorities that are going to be represented on our team. All right, so moving on from friction, the next thing I want to talk about is how we can make team conversations more productive by sharing a common language. In cross-functional communication, when we're discussing solutions to problems, it's easy for words to get ambiguous and open to interpretation. So, for instance, um, if I use the term table, depending on who I'm talking to, some people might picture this, or this, or if it's somebody in this room, they might picture something like this. But the more we can share a frame of reference, the more productive our conversations are going to be, especially when it comes to building products. And I believe that a component library can help to establish that frame of reference. So when I'm talking about a component library, what I'm describing is uh, a set of files and documentation, preferably both in code and in design, that house all of your most commonly used components. So things like your typeface system, button stylings, uh, table cells, navbar treatments, you name it. It's all in there. So when you're working with a designer, having a component library ensures consistency with every view that you build together. You're both able to see the entire ecosystem of components in your application at a glance. And what that means is that it's a lot easier to scrutinize new patterns against what's existing. 
And that, in turn, helps you decide if building out those new patterns is worth the extra effort. And it'll also help you avoid weird little quirks like this. So you can see we have actually the same components, but they're all styled just a little bit different, differently, right? So there's that inconsistency. And you'll see this more if you're working on an application that um, the uh, organizationally just have like a lot of designers working on different parts, or you have several different engineers working on different parts of your products. You can start to lose that consistency. So using a component library will help ensure that all those things are aligned across the different views. So while a component library in itself is awesome, I think that the real magic is found when you make that component library visible to everyone. You print it out, pin it up, share it out, let people write on it, ask you questions about it. In this way, what you're doing is you're passively educating stakeholders and team members on the anatomy of your applications, what things are called, what they look like, how they relate to one another. These are all things that they're going to be able to see and talk to you about. And getting back to that initial goal, these are going to be the things that are going to create that shared frame of reference so that you can have more productive conversations. All right, so just like the product roadmap, this one is a bit of a bear if you're trying to start from scratch. But if you're looking to dive a little bit deeper into this subject, I'd highly recommend checking out Brad Frost's work on atomic design. He has blog posts and a website dedicated to this. He just does a really excellent job of breaking down a component library into its smallest bits and then bubbling all those back up into larger feature experiences. All right, so that is actually it for our communication stuff. So now let's hop into some practical things that we can do to improve our mobile experiences. And I want to start by talking about performance. So there are, uh, there are tons of technical things that we can do to optimize our application's performance, right? But in this section, we're actually going to talk about a non-technical way that you can alter your application's perceived performance. 53% of mobile site visitors will leave a page that takes longer than three seconds to load. That's according to a study done by Google. So if we can't get a view loaded in three seconds, what are some things that we can get in there in the meantime? One possible solution is one you've probably already seen in some applications that you have on your phone right now. And it goes by a few different names, but while I was researching, I found that most commonly it's referred to as a skeleton screen. And a skeleton screen is really just a version of a view where everything that isn't stored locally is abstracted into a shape. There's no contrast there. But yes, the, the shapes of all the stories and the photo in the middle are abstracted out into uh, gray shapes that live within the view. It's not just a white screen. Wow. Um, so these skeleton screens actually exist in the space between the three second target that we're trying to hit and the time it takes to actually get that view fully loaded. So some apps that you might know that are using skeleton screens right now are Facebook. Golly, none of them are on there. I promise you they're on there in this thing if you were looking at my screen. Uh, Facebook, Slack, and YouTube. That's crazy. Um, so skeleton screens accomplish two things really well. First, they're great progress indicators. right? They give your users visual feedback that the app is working to load up the view that they navigated to. And second. They set an expectation for what types of content are going to load in that view and where that content is going to live. So when compared to an ambiguous spinner, skeleton screens are just a more informative loading experience. And they're also a nice trick to have up your sleeve when you've done all that you can from a technical standpoint to optimize the performance of your applications. All right, so moving on from performance, I want to talk about how we can make sure our users don't screw up. So just like we talked about positive friction and communication earlier, there are scenarios in which friction can be a positive thing in your application. And a great example of that is alerts. So in scenarios where users might accidentally take the wrong action, alerts serve as a great checkpoint for users before they take an unintended detour. So let's say that a user just filled out a form and they accidentally hit cancel in the nav bar. While it is friction, having an alert pop up to confirm that that's the action that the user actually wanted to take, that's a welcomed interruption, especially if it was an action that was uh, taken inadvertently. So at MailChimp, when a user decides to delete a campaign, we introduce a layer of friction in the form of this confirmation experience. 
And the experience explains that deleting is an irreversible action, and it serves as that checkpoint, right? We're letting users know you're about to take a detour. Do you want to take that detour? To further make sure that users absolutely want to take this action, we set the campaign to only delete if a user touches and holds on that main call to action button there in the middle, touch and hold to delete. So this does a couple things. First, it adds a fun little bit of interaction to this uh, experience that is destructive and might not be the most positive. The other thing that it does is it acts as sort of that final place where a user can decide if they want to change their mind. Um, it acts as that checkpoint for the detour, right? If they want to walk it back, they can. So friction can also be used to provide extra context around an action. Slack uh, leverages this confirmation dialog before allowing users to notify an entire channel of their message with the at everyone command. So if y'all are part of Slack teams that have larger channels that have tons of people in them, I'm sure you've seen this before. Um, so similar to the MailChimp example, Slack's just letting you know the implications of what you're about to do before they let you do it. And I think they did an awesome job with this experience for a number of different reasons. First, this can be pretty intimidating to know that the message you are about to send is actually going to reach, you know, let's say 60 or 70 across a whole bunch of different time zones. That can produce a little bit of anxiety. And I feel like they've disarmed that, not only the tone of the copy itself, but also the illustration to the right, as well as the actions that they allow the user to do now that they have all the information that they need, right? You can decide, YOLO, I'm just going to send this thing out, or you can walk it back at a message now that you know the impact that your message is going to have and how many people you're going to send it to. So granted, this isn't an example that's on a mobile platform, but the principles are all the same. Slack's introducing some friction into this action that could potentially be super impactful in ways that a user might not have been aware of. So those are some applications of friction, but we want to ask ourselves when, when it's appropriate to use friction. Right? And a good way to evaluate, uh, to evaluate uh, when friction is appropriate is to establish criteria. And everybody's list is going to be a little bit different, but these are the three questions I ask myself when I'm determining whether or not uh, friction is appropriate. So first, is this an irreversible action? Is this something that a user is not going to be able to undo? Second, is this going to be something that's going to be super frustrating for my user if they were to do it on accident? And lastly, does this action have some sort of unforeseen impact that I should make the user aware of? Cool. So those are, are a few different ways that uh, we can help our users not screw up. And I wanted to finish out today by talking about a longstanding feature in iOS that's both powerful uh, and also, unfortunately, easy to overuse. Notifications. So, Notifications can be an incredibly powerful way to communicate with our users. However, by their very nature, notifications can be intrusive and disruptive, so we want to make sure that we're using notifications. Notifications are most effective when they're timely, personal, and relevant. And all of it starts by us asking our users for permission to send them our notifications. So we want to keep in mind that every single app these days that's out there is asking our users if they can send them notifications. So we're probably going to have to work a little bit harder to convince our users as to why they should accept notifications from us. And a great way to accomplish this is to use what's called a pre-permission check. Now, a pre-permission check is a custom dialog or experience that exists before that OS-level notification opt-in. And the goal of the pre-permission check is to frame up the value proposition for users of why they should accept notifications before we fire that um, OS level notifications opt-in. So for example, at Yik Yak, our pre-permission check was part of the onboarding experience. Once a new user made it to the main feed, we'd explain the value that they'd get out of turning notifications on. And if the user tapped yes, we'd immediately throw up that OS level notifications opt-in. We'd even put the uh, positive action that they would take sort of in that same space so that hopefully it was just a quick two taps and we got them opted in. If they didn't tap yes on our pre-permission experience, that was fine. We'd just dis display the same dialog at some other point in the experience. It's really important where you place that dialog if you're going to do it again 
Um, so for us, if a user decided to not, allow, to not opt into notifications here at the main feed level, we would wait until they posted their first yak. Um, and when they did that, creating content, uh, we would then fire a pre-permission that the content was a little bit more optimized for that scenario, and it would essentially say, you've just created content. Um, turn on notifications so that you can be notified when someone replies um, to the post that you just made. So in this way, we made sure that strategically we put the second version of that pre-permission in a place where we thought they'd have the highest likelihood uh, of converting and turning those notifications on. So there are two main benefits to using pre-permission checks. The first is you get to present your value proposition in your brand voice, right? So rather than that impersonal alert, this is a chance for your users and your brand to connect as you tell that story of why they should allow you to send them notifications. And second, you're not gonna get another chance at a simple yes or no prompt in the future if users opt out of that OS notification dialog. So like we talked about earlier, if a user declines to opt into your notifications and the pre-permissions, that's totally fine. We can find some place to hit them with that same experience, and we'll do it strategically so that we're putting it in a place where we think they have the highest likelihood to turn it back on. If, however, a user opts out of our notifications at the OS permission alert, they're gonna have to take a bunch of steps in order to turn those notifications back on. So at that point, our value proposition for why they would wanna turn our notifications back on has gotta be even better than it would have been initially. It's a task that's gonna require a whole lot of effort on the part of our users, and it's just not a situation that we wanna be in if we can prevent it. So, if the worst happens, and we find ourselves in that situation, um, what are some things that we can do to get our users to opt back in to receiving our notifications? So even though, like we just talked about, all the steps that a user would need to take in order to turn notifications back on if they opted out, even if all those steps happened outside of our application, we can still guide that journey with something called a re-engagement experience. And the first thing that we would wanna do with the re-engagement experience is identify the best place to put it, right? Much like we did with the pre-permissions, we wanna put it in the place where we feel like our users have the highest likelihood of taking the action that we want them to take which in this case would be turning notifications back on. So in MailChimp, one of the places we put our notifications re-engagement experience is in our in-app notification settings. We put it there because we believe that users who are navigating to the settings inside of our app and looking for settings specific to our notifications, they probably at some level already get the value that our notifications would deliver. Maybe that means that uh, marketing collateral that, collateral that we've sent out is working. Maybe that means they've heard it through word of mouth, how awesome our notifications are. However they arrived at it, they're looking in the app to figure out, okay, what's the business with all these notifications? So in that way, we're making sure that we're putting that re-engagement experience in a place where we think users have the highest likelihood of taking the action that we want them to take. So for the experience, when a user taps on that uh, notification cell, they go to the notification screen, um, and this bottom sheet here uh, pops up. So through illustration and copy, we walk them through the steps that they would need to take in order to turn their notifications back on. We also provide a button that deep links, that deep links users straight into the application's settings at the OS level. And in this way, what we do is we save them all those steps of going to their settings, finding our application amongst all the other ones that they have on their phone, drilling into it, going to notifications. We get rid of all that, provide one button that gets them where they need to go to take the action we want them to take. So let's say permissions are not a thing. We got permissions and we're good to go. What kind of notifications should we be sending? So like we covered earlier, a quality notification is one that's timely, relevant, and personal. So let's look at this notification that got sent to us by Netflix. It says, come look at the new movies we've added to your favorite genres. They've checked the box in that they've sent a notification, but I don't really get a ton of value out of that, and I'm not sure that I'd be opening it. But let's compare that to this. Hey, Brian, Stranger Things, Stranger Things season three is now on Netflix. What? So 
I, I would imagine I would probably open that. I, I might break my phone opening that notification too quickly. <laughs> so, <laughs> right, right, exactly. <laughs> it's perfect. Um, so, if we compare the two, we can see that what, no, what Netflix did there was they used my consumption patterns to service a notification with content that's relevant. The notification mattered when I got it, so it's timely. And not only is the content specific to me, but they also addressed it to me right there in the notification, making it personal. So granted, we're not all going to have the mountains and mountains of user behavior and data that Netflix has, but you can see that the principles are all there. That notification was to me about something that I'm interested in, and it mattered in that moment. Another app that I think is doing notifications really well is Redbox. So if you give Redbox your location permissions, they'll send you uh, promotional codes in the form of notifications only when you're in the vicinity of one of their dispensers. So rather than send you a promo code while you're at home sitting on the couch, it reaches you in a setting where they feel like you have the highest likelihood of taking the action that you want to take, that they want you to take, which in their case would be enjoying a free movie on Monday, it looks like. So quality notifications, they're also ones that, require, that don't require users to have to navigate in order to get to their value. And deep linking is a great way of handling that. So if we look back at our Netflix notification, if we're the user, the expected value that we see from that notification is being able to stream the newest season of Stranger Things right now. Right? And without deep linking, it would be on us as the user to use that notification to open the application, search for the title we're looking for, go to its page, find the season, start the season. Tons and tons of steps. But with deep linking, as the user, we're taken straight from the notification into the view that delivers on that value that was promised in the notification when we sent it. So in this way, not only has Netflix sent us a notification that's timely, relevant, and personal, They've also sent one that doesn't ask a lot of us as the user to arrive at the value that they promised when they sent it. So to wrap up notifications, it's important to keep in mind that notifications can be intrusive even if they're helpful. They disrupt use of other applications. They live on our lock screen. We want to keep that in mind when it comes to the content that we're sending in those notifications. We also want to remember that we have a much higher likelihood of people opting into our notifications with a branded pre-permission experience over that standard OS level permissions alert. And the same rule applies when we're trying to get users to turn notifications back on. And in both of those cases, we want to place those prompts where we believe that users will have the highest likelihood of taking the action that we want them to take. All right. So as we wind down today, I want to go over some of the stuff that we talked about. We started by talking about communication and how things like a product roadmap and a component library can make internal conversations more productive. And we also talked about the natural friction that comes along with building software on a cross-functional team and how it can help to balance priorities. And then we shifted to some practical ways that we can improve our mobile experiences, things like making our applications seem more performant, even if technically they aren't. And we also talked about the do's and don'ts of notifications, and how we can help our users make sure that they don't screw up. So when you think about it, that first half we were really talking about how to talk to each other, and in the second half we were talking about how our products talk to our users. And I think that doing the first part well ensures that you're going to be able to do the second part well. We have to communicate well with one another if we want our products to be able to communicate well with our users. Because again, Good experiences, they don't come from good designers, they come from good teams. And teams that build products that are the sum of all those weird, awesome perspectives that went into them. So I'm not sure if all that landed, but uh, I do hope that uh, at least some part of this presentation made you feel empowered, if you didn't already, made you feel empowered to contribute that unique perspective of yours onto the experiences that you're building, because in the end, the experience belongs to you, and it belongs to me, and it belongs to all of us, and it doesn't matter what our role is, we can all contribute to making that experience the best that it can be. And that's all I have. Thanks, y'all.